Hello and welcome to Bastion Home Broadcasting, um, where tonight we are carrying on what we started last week, but with a slightly different theme. Um, so last week we spoke a little bit about um, what I was calling qualitative monster design, which is a very awkward word to keep using. So I'm going to try not to say qualitative too many times tonight, but that's what I'm talking about, <laughs> meaning designing monsters that are built through their qualities rather than their quantities, i.e. their numbers, and less sort of um, less sort of interaction with the rules of the game and more kind of descriptive things. And I teased this a little bit in one of the posts I did earlier today where I spoke about how I wanted to... I, I sort of... I had an idea for a type of rules-heavy game that I would enjoy. And it was a bit of a tease, really, because what I was getting at was I'd spoken about this idea of um, having a rules-heavy world rather than a rules-heavy system. So lots of games have worlds that have their own internal rules. So if we're looking at something like D&D &D, then and we're looking at monsters, then you could think of something like the fact that, you know, this isn't even D&D, &D, but things like a werewolf can't be harmed except by silver. Or that a, um, you know, a sphinx is going to ask you a riddle, and if you ask the riddle, it has to let you past. These kinds of rules that players learn as they explore the game. And, you know, there's some things like I've just spoken about with the werewolf that they might know already from sort of mythology. But the kind of like D&D &D specific ones are still in there as well. So things like knowing about green, green slime, knowing how... Um, knowing about how a rust monster works. These are rules of the world that players learn about. And I kind of like the idea of exploring that a little bit more. Um, I don't know where this is going in terms of like what this would be, but it's something that I would like to try out. So I am kind of tinkering around with a system. Which <laughs> I'm calling the qualitative system, which is absolutely not... Uh, what it would be called, but I, I've been using it for this kind of ask the stars idea that I've been posting about a lot lately. But basically, it's like an ultra light system, uh, and the main point of this is by having a super light system, I can really focus in on just creating situations that are interesting. And then all it comes down to is: do the is the the player who's attempting the action do they have an edge or do they not have an edge? And that's all you need to worry about. And then you roll the dice and get your result. Um, so. With that in mind, the inspiration for tonight was originally I was going to do a little bit more monster design. And I thought, well, I could pick up like a new monster book, you know, something at the something at the real cutting edge of design. And then I have to give credit to Cosmic Orrery. Um and if you are not reading Cosmic Orrery's blog already, uh, their blog is fantastic. Um, and I somehow stumbled onto their old post about the Death Knight. And, you know, they've actually started up the Death Knight essentially for Electric Bastion Land or Into the Odd. So it's all kind of, you know, done my work for me there. But I saw this and I thought, well, could could could, could we take this and could I take out even the, the bare minimum of quantities that exist in a an Into the Odd monster? Could I take those out and have like a purely um, descriptive monster? Um, Judith, Judith Priest has said just call it diegetic already I'm not calling it the diegetic system there's no way but you you have called me out because I'm going to say diegetic very soon I'm afraid to say um, but anyway in looking at Cosmic Orrery's blog I did then end up reading more about the Fiend Folio because I have I already obviously know about the Fiend Folio but I'd kind of forgotten it exists and uh, Cosmic Orrery uh, well Phineas rather uh, Cosmic Orrery uh They've been going through the Fiend Folio one monster at a time. And I, I read a few and I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to read the rest of these. Because I thought I'll go and buy the Fiend Folio. And we're going to see if we can take some monsters in the Fiend Folio. And see if I can convert them into something that would work for this kind of very loose idea I have. Um, so let's get... I'm I'm already like removing this. I'm calling it the Q system for now. <laughs> that's my that's my code word. Code word. I have been calling it Ask the Stars, but you know. Um, so the in in doing this, I 
I'm going to talk about diegesis now. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to sort of have monster entries and even things like player classes. I wanted to have them. My kind of idea was whether you could have a system that is the actual bits of the system feel diegetic. And part of the inspiration for this was I was recommended by, I think I read it on Dreaming Dragon Slayer blog and then subsequently watched the review on Questing Beast of the Young Adventurers collection, which is obviously not pitched at my age bracket. Um, but these are like, well, they are essentially children's books to like introduce kids to D&D. But what's interesting is it will like describe D&D &D things, but they don't use any like rules. So they'll describe what, you know, a polymorph spell does, but it's just written almost as if you were reading it in the spell book. And, you know, there's, a, there's also one for monsters, one for classes. It describes classes without actually giving you any mechanical class abilities. And from here, I kind of moved to looking at could we create like mon uh, classes that, you know, playbooks aren't a new thing, but kind of class playbooks that kind of feature like a kind of diegetic little playbook that contains the actual knowledge of that character. So some of the laws of the world that this character knows about and how they can exploit them. So I tried it with a ranger and this is something I'm going to be posting about on the blog um, possibly this week. Um, but continuing that theme, I then thought, like I say, I went and I did a thing about the Death Knight. And the other way that I've been looking at this is I called it qualitative design but another word that I like to use is absolute, using lots of absolutes. So having things, rather than saying like, oh, that they will try and do this, and there's a 50% chance it works, saying that they will always do this, or saying that they cannot do this. So for the Death Knight, we have examples like they must obey commands from ancient noble blood. Or they stop at nothing when they're acting to correct some half-remembered shame of their bloodline. And... I want to see if we can continue that theme and kind of create create monsters that have their own kind of rules without being like an outright, you know, trick monster where you have to like work out the one trick that beats the monster. I think you can keep it, you can make it more interesting than that. Um, I, I like the idea of creating problems that can be overcome in multiple ways, obviously. Um, but I think this kind of system of absolutes that you can learn about a monster is an interesting way of doing it. So, we are going to look through the theme folio, not the whole thing. We're going to flick through until I find a monster that I like the look of, and then we're going to see if we can make them into an interesting monster design. I will apologise that I've like rambled about three, four different topics already. I'm topping up my drink because today is the first day, well, it's the first Tuesday in the UK where it's actually been warm, and my, my brain can't handle it, so... I know I'm a little bit scatterbrained at the best of times, but today I feel especially like unfocused. So, so, so bear with me. We'll, we'll, we'll try and actually get something achieved. So, for those who don't know, the Fiend Folio is interesting because it's kind of like a weird alternative monster manual from like early D and D at first edition, I believe. Um, and what's interesting about it is the very short version is I believe that most of the monsters in here were like in white dwarf magazine uh so designed in the uk and then kind of thrown together into this compendium so it's got a similar effect to the the fighting fantasy out of the pit book where a lot of the monsters they feel like they were designed for like one thing for someone's homebrew and that they don't necessarily feel coherent they don't feel like you know this is the dark sun um monster manual this feels like it's a random grab bag of weird monsters of, of very variable quality is what i hear um, but we're, we're going to have a little look through. And I actually bought this today. Like this is this is how bad it's gotten. Like I, I am so much on the cutting edge of RPG design that I've paid money to buy the Fiend Folio. Um, okay, we don't care about all this. So, uh, Aracocra. Uh, I I don't know. I feel like we can't go for one of the A monsters. We're gonna we're gonna breeze through. If anybody has any particular favourites from the Fiend Folio, then um, we're going to... 
then, then absolutely let me know if there's any favorites in here that I should be looking out for. Uh, Dreaming Dragon Slayer, we, we are joined by Blog Royalty here, uh, says that Weird Brood in the UK is definitely better than that of the US. Normally I would say like it's just a, you know, it, it, it's just a case of maybe if you're in the US, it, it, some of the British stuff might feel more weird to you and likewise if you're in the UK some of the American stuff feels a bit weirder to you but um, there's definitely a distinct type of weird stuff that you get from the UK I think um, so what we're looking for is a monster that I mean something is drawing me to this guy uh, Berberlang which, which <laughs> Sounds like something I should like be putting into a song. Um, they have a nice long description. I, I've never heard of this monster before, so I don't have any like preconceptions. Um, can I switch to a one-page view, please? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna see if the Berberlang has any interesting ideas. Now I don't care about any of this stuff unless there's anything that's leaping out to me here. Um, they're very intelligent. They're chaotic evil. What else is new? So the Berberlang is a solitary biped with leathery skin and bat-like wings. Its eyes are white and watery, and its powers of improvision are twice as effective as elves. That is the kind of irrelevant bullshit that I really don't care about. Like, <laughs> I don't know. In improvision for me, like, it it's fine to say they have improvision, but to say that they're twice as effective as an elf, I don't know. Um, the creature spends the greater part of each month in an apparently dormant state hibernating preferably in a well-hidden cave. Though seemingly comatose, the Berberlang is actually roaming the astral plane where it spends its time hunting and killing creatures weaker than itself and engaging in a bizarre ritual of complex courtship and mating rituals with other Berberlangs. I feel like we're not going to uh, be putting that bit in there. Um, I don't know, actually. It, it is kind of... It, it's it's so, like, goofy as a monster that like, I, I, I feel like you couldn't make it creepy. Uh, if its body is discovered and interfered with... They will attempt to return to the body and reanimate it. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So why do we care? So it's it's hiding and like hibernating while it roams the astral plane. But wh wh why do we care here on the mortal plane? For three days... Oh, hang on. Does it hide on the... Yeah, so it, it is on the material plane when it's hibernating. For three days each month, at the time of the full moon, the Berberlang returns to its material body, only to alter its form of trance and send forth a physical projection of itself upon the prime material plane. So it's still hiding its true body. It's sending out like a ghost to search for food. A freshly killed human corpse. Its projection is physical, and it's a duplicate of the original. So, I, so far, I, I kind of like the idea of, like, it, it's like this weird little astral projection monster that goes and, like, hides somewhere in, like, a corner and then projects out of its body to do its ill bidding. Um, and I guess the obvious thing to do would be to make it that you need to, like, find the original, find the actual mortal body of this thing. Um... Ah, and if it's hit, it comes... Okay, so it'll go back towards the body. If the projection is killed, there was a 75% chance the original will die from system shock. We, we can do something better than that. If it survives an attack, it will eventually seek revenge. I like, I like vengeance as a thing. You know, in life and in design. It's, it's a great motivator. If the projection is forced back to the body before the Berberlang was able to feed, or if the projection was destroyed before feeding, a new projection will go forth again as soon as possible. So, you know, I said I wanted a rules-heavy world. This is this is all getting a little bit fiddly for me. Like, I say rules-heavy, I still want to be able to get it into bullet points. Um, 
like the majority of the rules here are about how its projection works. Okay, so they'll, they'll move to a new area now and then. If it kills a human, it will immediately pick up the body and fly at full rate back to the host. <laughs> Hang on. While in flight, the projection will be feeding on the body. A fully grown human can thus be devoured in one turn, leaving only the bones, garments, and equipment. I, I forget how turns and rounds work in, in AD and D. I think this is AD and D. Um... Yeah, I, I forget how they work, so I, I I don't. But that seems like a very quick amount of time to like clean a body of of it all meat. Yeah, I'm I'm already seeing like conflicting information in the chat. Uh, yeah, it's it's either ten minutes or one minute. I can't remember which way around it is either. Um, how the bovine derives substance when only its projection feeds, and how it reproduces when all mating activity takes place on the astral plane are mysteries so far unexplained. I don't mind that because. It kind of like gives you something to, I mean, who gives a shit? Like, are you gonna want to discover the like the mating ritual of this thing? Um, okay, we've got we've got something to work with here. So let's go. Let's do it. I, I can't read this, the name of this thing without getting that stupid Black Betty song in my head. Um, okay, so Berberlang. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't have like a real solid format for this. I just have like some like, for want of a better word, like tags that might just be relevant to know. Like it, you, you kind of need to know that a Death Knight is undead if you don't already know about it. It might be useful to know that it's armored. Um, So I think what what is this thing? It's a it's a biped. Is it? I mean the the one I don't want to say good thing about late traditions of D and D is this thing would be classified as like an outsider or a an aberration or whatever. But I don't, you know it's kind of like a weird planar monster, I guess. I, I I guess it's like it's doing a lot of astral projections. So I'm going to say it's like a psionic. And we don't have to define what that means. It just means that we could potentially call on that tag. Um, and I guess it's just like a, a monster, isn't it? Okay, and then we're going to give it some... So I guess it's kind of like moves, but we're kind of creating rules of the world that apply to this thing. So the kind of thing I want to do is have things that either start with like must do this, cannot do this, or when X then why so you know rules rather than rather than moves um so what's the deal with this thing so first we're going to get like the basics of its behavior so it hides um hides its fragile real body And projects. I'm gonna call it like a spirit self. And then I'm just gonna bold like some interesting bits. Um so must feed on freshly killed humans. I mean, in the description, it says that it feeds on freshly killed humans, but it doesn't say that it's like doing the killing itself. So I know I don't care about these, but what's its deal? It's got one, one plus one hit die. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a combat monster. Well, you know what, let's, let's, let's split this up. How is its real fragile body? most of the time and then it like projects a spirit self to 
perform most actions. I don't know. Project your spirit self to hunt, mate, or what else can it do? We'll just go with hunt or mate in the classics. Project your spirit self to hunt or mate, which cannot be um, cannot be harmed by mundane attacks. Must feed on freshly killed humans, and would rather not do the killing itself. I like the specificity that it feeds on freshly killed humans. Like that's that's a little bit weird, um, but I do like it. I thought we've missed off a key thing here that it can fly. So let's. What what else were the, some of the? Um, Ah, so if it's hurt when, yeah, so this is like a when X, then Y. So if the spirit self is harmed it flies back to its real body. If the spirit self is destroyed I mean, I guess in game terms, like if we kill the spirit self, then we kind of don't care what happens to the, um, what happens to the original. If the spirit self is destroyed, the real body swears vengeance once it restores its spiritual energy because we, we did have this vengeance so you know <clears throat> I don't think this monster is too bad I think there's actually some some interesting stuff there Cannot lose sight of its spirit self is interesting, actually. That's from Dreaming Dragon Slayer. Um, yeah, I think that's like a good cannot. So the spirit self cannot project further than. I don't like like having to be inside of it because I I do like the idea that it's like hiding in some cave. So the spirit itself cannot project further than. I mean, I, I kind of don't want to put like um, <clears throat> an arbitrary distance. Yeah, last argument first is like going down the same lines I was thinking about, like hearing range. I do like using range of like shouting range, conversation range. I'm really bad at like if you just if you tell me something's two hundred feet away, I'm like I've got no idea. But if you're like it's it's shouting range, or it's like the distance you can throw a tennis ball, I'm like yeah, I know I know how far that is. Um, can't project further than than. I'm just going to put normal hearing range. Which is ridiculous. But I, it kind of fits the kind of fairy tale logic we're going for here. So, one of the things that I like about this is what I want to do with I want to do it with this kind of playbook idea for classes that I was talking about I want to have like blanks that can be filled in so the obvious example would be like a spell book where your wizard might have a spell book that has a lot of spells in and some of them you know some of them require things that you aren't able to do yet but I also want to have like blank spaces for you to learn new spells um, and like for the ranger I'm thinking of having some kind of like survival guide that you can add in so things that you learn you can kind of add to your playbook rather than like just ticking a box because you've now unlocked something you're actually you're actually building your you're kind of building the world as you build your character so 
I, I do want to kind of put in that thing about a mystery in here. Like people not knowing what its agenda is. So although it's not very helpful to like the GM, I think this is this is a this is my hot take. This is my controversial moment. Its agenda is currently unknown. Which feels like a cop out and it's the kind of thing you would get in like a rubbish monster manual, but I think it kind of gives you something to to wonder about. I don't know. Is it dead? Is that ridiculous? Is that just weak design? I wouldn't want to do that a lot, but I think I like the idea that it kind of begs a question. So that is the Berberlang. Um, let's do another. Yeah, Void Case says about the hearing range because the projection constantly makes a noise that the Berberlang needs to hear. Yeah, so I was thinking about something like having it whistle and like, so you could kind of follow the sound. Yeah, you know what, I'm going to do that. So, where is it? While projecting, um, the spirit self project further than the Cannot project further than the. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, w I would rewrite this if I was doing this in a book. But the um, the auditory. No, the, what, what am I trying to say? Cannot project further. I want to say like the distance away that you can still hear like the heartbeat. So let's start again. While projecting, the real body, the real body's heartbeat becomes a loud, steady thump. The projection cannot go, cannot travel. The projection must stay within hearing range of this heartbeat. There you go. Okay, fine. That, that's clumsy, but you, you get you get what I'm getting at. So let's go back to the fiend folio. I have to say, so far, that's that's like a decent monster. Um, I, I do like the the blind home, but I've I've seen this before. And I do, um, I do like it, but I kind of want to pick something that I've not really had much exposure to. Um, <laughs> there, there is, there are some great illustrations. Um, part of the reason I bought this, I, I sound like I'm advertising for like TSR and Dry Throw RPG, but the the print on demand copy was the same price as the PDF. It was like ten pounds uh, GBP for both plus plus shipping so I've got that coming to me and I, I'm going to enjoy looking at the illustrations Bullywugs are obviously one of the ones to uh, to make the leap if you like into like mainstream D&D monsterdom um, the bunyip I feel like I know it looks like a possum like it's got that possum face um, a carbuncle is like kind of a guilty pleasure That's I. If you're not familiar with the carbuncle, I, I will indulge for just a moment. So it's like an armadillo, that is like no threat. It's got no no attacks. Um, nothing of any real interest here. It has chaotic tendencies. Um, it's like an armored armadillo. Um. And it has a big ruby in its head that's worth, um, you know, 500 to 1,000 gold pieces. Or we even 5,000 gold pieces. It has empathy and telepathy. And if attacked, it puts up no resistance, is easily captured, but it will will itself to die. And... It just it just wills itself to die if it's if it's placed under duress, um, which causes the gem to I think like crumble or something. Yeah, and and it will tell you how much its gem is worth. It will say, "Hey, check out this gem in my head. It's worth five thousand gold." 
but then if you try to take it back to the city it'll just die and the gem crumbles out anyway uh, Cosmic Aurora you missed you missed your shout out um, I'm, I'm crediting you with inspiring me to look through the fiend folio and do a little bit of monster design so enough enough messing around let's find an actual good monster um, let, let's let's move a bit further into the book because we're we're in the early stages here <laughs> I, I do like the jelly baby guy oh yeah yeah okay I, I know the enveloper um eye killer right we'll go we'll, I'm gonna immediately without hesitation go for the eye killer because I've never heard of the eye killer it is not the latest Apple product. Forgive me for the dad joke. Um, eye killer. So how can we make this monster interesting? Maybe we should actually read it. Um, so what's the deal? We don't really care about these numbers, but anything interesting? It has a death stare. Um, animal intelligence. It's chaotic evil. And um, I don't know. I, I'm picking an old battle here, but I, I feel like animal intelligence shouldn't be able to be chaotic evil. I feel like they can't be that um, invested in the, you know, ideology of the of the multiverse. So at birth, the eye killer is limbless and almost spherical. Cool. Uh, later, it develops a bat-like upper torso on the body of a large snake. We're continuing the theme of just sticking animals together. Its stunted, stunted wings cannot support flight. The upper part of its body is a dark grey-green, while the lower part is medium green, flecked with dull yellow. Its eyes are disproportionately large and apparently lidless. So far, there is nothing interesting about this. Uh, the creature dislikes daylight and hates bright naked flame. Okay, so we, we know that. That's good. So let's let, let's get that down. Hates uh, daylight and open flames. Um, dwells in dark places where two to eight may also be found. Um, what? I guess, I guess it's an animal, and it can fly. And I guess like nocturnal. No, I suppose it's like subterranean, isn't it? Again, these are just tags to help us help us out, really, if we need to get a quick glimpse of the monster. The behaviour of this creature depends almost entirely on the illumination. If approached and attacked by creatures relying solely on infravision or low-level natural ambient illumination, the eye killer will attack with its coils only, crushing the victim. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so in the dark, it acts like a snake... And if they're carrying lanterns or torches, it will use its dreaded death stare. Its eyes gather the illumination and amplify it enormously and project it back at the light bearer in a narrow ray of intense light. Light. The ray strikes the victim as though they were AC ten. Um, blah blah blah. I mean, is is it not a save versus death ray? Oh, it is. It is. It is. If a torch or lantern bearers come close to the eye killer, it will not face the light and will try to flee. Okay, okay, okay. So we've got a simple kind of three, three-tiered behavior there. So in darkness, it is a placid creature, but. but will constrict prey or attackers with its snake-like tail. In low light, in fact, we can, we can get rid of this. In low light, it rears up and opens its gigantic eyes. Absorbing the light. 
before eventually blasting it. I'm just going to keep it as a death, death stare. It's, it's strong. Um, in bright light or in the face of open flames. Cowers away and flees. Okay. So I think we have, you know, an, a kind of interesting animal. We have like an, a, a semi interesting animal, but it's not really. A monster at the moment. So what I'm going to suggest we do is we get rid of this animal thing and we're going to say it's like a lesser demon. I'm, I'm promoting the eye killer after all these years. I don't know whether the eye killer has made any subsequent appearances um, but we're going to upgrade him slightly and we're going to give him some kind of agenda. So, he's, he's lurking around, you know. Oh, no, he can't fly. Why, why did I say he could fly? Um, we're going to give him some kind of agenda because at the moment he's just like a, a little animal that might, might give you a death ray blast. Um... So let's say what 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 a good thing that I'm trying to do at the moment with monsters is to um, yeah last argument first has said vestigial wings are kind of key and we'll we'll tie those into its like demonic origin. But what I'm trying to think of with monsters now is I always try and include um, or rather I, I I'm going to try and start including um, some sort of note for what happens if the, if this monster wins. So if you try and fight it or you try and get past it and the dice go against you and the, the monster wins, what happens? And it should be more interesting than just they kill you and eat you. Um, so, you know, the Burbalang, I'm not saying this is the pinnacle of monster design, but I guess they kind of, if they, they're only going to carry off a single, um, a single freshly killed human. And, and you know what? I actually prefer that they have to eat the their fragile body has to be the one that eats the human. Um, so if if I was writing this up properly, I would have that the you know they have to carry the body back to the not the body sorry they have to carry the sort of knocked out human back to its layer and then kill it, you know, and so that the the real body can eat it. So what what can be this thing's kind of agenda here? Um, it, Cosmic Horror says it can't stand daylight, so it crawls into your body and drives you around. And it drives, yeah, and drives it around. That I, I do kind of like the whole possession angle. But what's it doing? It destroys all your sources of light and leaves you alone in the dark. Um, maybe it's just like a... So, Vestigial Wings hint at its nature as a fallen demon it is trying to reclaim its place in the hierarchy of hell by leaving adventurers wounded in the dark and alerting more powerful demons. So I guess he, he's just going to mess you up and then summon, like, or call for a more powerful demon. So this is a bit clumsily written, but we're, ju we're just trying to get, like, the main point of it tonight. So, yeah, it's like this this whole species used to be, like, a more powerful demon, but whatever reason, they got cursed and sent out to just do this job. So they're trying to, like, reclaim their place. Yeah. Uh, why it was here points out that I'm not using WordPad. I know it's it's a disaster. Um, I've become everything I ever hated. <laughs> it 
some of these illustrations, like the the, the tone is um, all over the place. Fire newt. I kind of like it. What's the deal? There's some kind of lizard man. There's a lot of... No, okay. Don't care. Um, fire toad. Fire snake. The, obviously the flail snail is a classic. Flump, of course. Uh, for for Laren. So we've already got like kind of a slightly devilly kind of guy. Um, <laughs> I don't know why this illustration is so funny to me. Frostman. Is is this a real thing? Yeah, they just make make it cold. Gambardo. Is a uh, wow. So the garbug is is pretty great. It's a flying lobster. Um. We have obviously Gith Yankees, Gibberlings, you know. There's a few, there's a few in this book that made the made the leap. This gorilla bear is already like my least favorite monster I've ever seen. Is it, is it literally just? Yeah, it, it's just a a worse gorilla or worse bear. The gorbel is like a personal favorite. I I can't, I can't do the gorbel because I'm too too emotionally attached. Um. What's, what's a griff? Okay. Um, oh, no, hang on. I can see. Oh, I don't know. We've already done a demon, but I, I like... If it's coming out of an egg, then I'm on board. Uh, we'll do this griff because I've never heard of this thing before. So a griff. What's the deal? It doesn't have anything particularly special in its stat block, which is good. It's a bird with multiple legs. Perfect for a roast dinner. Usually four, but specimens with six or eight have been seen. It approximates to the size of an eagle and has a razor sharp beak with powerful jaws. Its bite will inflict blah blah blah. It will normally attack at high speed from high up in the shadows of an underground cavern. Maneuverability class B, which I'm sure you'll all remember. Um, if three or more are encountered, one will be female and there's a 35% chance she'll be ready to lay her eggs. Okay, okay, so here's the interesting bit. It, it injects you with eggs. It's taken this far for us to get to the interesting bit. Now, I don't care about... If, if the whole point of this monster is that, like, they can lay eggs in you, I don't want there to be a 65% chance that there is a female bird present, but, oh, well, she's not ovulating, I'm afraid, so we can't use this monster's signature ability. Um, is it literally just, like, a bird that lays its eggs in you? Oh. So if the eggs remain alive, they will hatch in one to three days, killing the victim immediately and releasing one to four baby griffs. Um, there are far more than one to four eggs in the victim. It is simply that number which survived the one to three day period. So this is actually kind of like a bullshit monster because it's like, a, a, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem that interesting to me that it's a bird that lays eggs in you and then they burst out of you. Um... I think it's okay. I don't, I don't like dislike it, but I'm, I'm not. We want to cap tonight off with a you know a better monster than that. So I'm gonna cheat slightly. The hook horror is great. Um, Hound of ill omen. It sounds like he's already perfect. Um, The Jacqueline looks kind of good. Let's 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 go down. We we we've we've picked one from the top, one from the middle. Let's pick one from the, the rear end of the book, so to speak. Um, the, the Sandman is just a guy made of sand. Oh, and he puts you to sleep. Slad, or, or you know. 
Yeah, I mean, Romain points out that the Slad do the whole laying egg thing, and they're, and they're actually interesting monsters anyway, like... Yeah. I did not know there were Slad lords. Live and learn. A son of Kyus. Well, you know what, we haven't done an undead really yet. Let's see what we can do. So, a son of Kyus. They are chaotic evil, low intelligence. Uh, they have regeneration, which I'm assuming will be detailed here. Oh, okay, so they're like, they're animated with fat green worms crawling in and out of their skulls. So they are, oh yeah, Kyos is like the worm guy. Does that, it rings a bell. They are surrounded by a spherical zone of fear. Okay, okay. We, we can make this work. So this is a son of Kyus. They are undead. And that, that's kind of all we know for now. So what's the deal? Um, they're surrounded by a zone of fear. So we'll we'll make that fear zone a bit more interesting. Um, they regenerate two hit points per round. Its limbs will regenerate even if severed. Even after death, this will continue. The only way of destroying these is by fire, lightning, acid, or the application of holy water. Mm, that's kind of bollocks. That's like that's too many ways to do it. So regenerates from any physical harm. Uh, out of those. I kind of like that lightning is like the only way to get them because lightning is like the like it's easy to it's easy to get some fire some holy water you can buy some acid but if you know that these things you have to get them with lightning it it, it makes it makes them a bit scary regenerates from any physical harm with only lightning truly killing them Uh, so the fear zone um, causes the weak world to flee. So if we were using this kind of like this Q system that I'm calling it, um, I don't need to like define this really because if the fear zone just means that um, you know are you weak willed then no you're fine. It, it, but it, if you've got like hirelings you might have to roll to like stop them running away. Um, or if your character is somehow weak-willed, you might have to roll. Um, we can afford to be a little bit loose about it. Um, they attack with double-handed flailing of fists. Oh, wow. So each successful hit has a 25% chance of inflicting advanced leprosy on the victim. Okay, interesting. Oh, and one worm per round will jump from a son's head to an adjacent character. So the fact that the worms are trying to jump into you is much more interesting than getting leprosy and, you know, dying in six months. So we're not going to bother with, like, disease. Um, we're going to just make them... It's going to be a fear and sting zone. And they can vomit and flee. Let's make, let's make these guys truly gross. Um... Controlled by worms. So worms will leap from the sun's head if they sense a new host. They cannot leap far, but if But if they are able to burrow into a host, here we go. Only controlled electrocution will kill the worm. So we'll come back to this lightning thing. Like, for some reason, they have like a weird lightning electricity vulnerability. So you have to like somehow shock yourself just enough to kill the worm. 
Um, there's, there's stuff here about like, oh yeah, what happens if they actually get you? So, if the worm is left inside the host, they die. When do they die? One to four melee rounds? No, they die the next morning. They die at midnight. Let's make it more spooky. Oh, they die at sundown and return as a son of Kyus at midnight. There we go. So we've got our son of Kyus. Um, so there we go. I think we've got some interesting monsters there. Let's let's do a quick breeze through, and see if we've missed any incredible gems. Um, let's, let's treat ourselves. Um, Tabaxi. Weirdly, I was like surprised when I was looking through these um, young adventurers guides that I saw Tabaxi is in there as like a player race. Which is, you know, it just feels it just feels like not. <laughs> this is making me sound like a proper old grumpy old man, but they, I, I never got the cat people thing in D and D. Like it, it always felt like something that I would read on like a GeoCities webpage rather than see in a D and D book. So seeing them kind of there was weird. Same with the the tur the turtle men, tur turtles are they called? You know, they're in there as well. Like Ken Kenku, I will I I have more affection for I think um, I mean yeah Dreaming Dragon Slayer says there are too many player races in there I, I kind of if it's about like I think if I was imagining myself being like I don't know what 10 years old or whatever reading this I think I would be happy to have more of everything so I, I like I wouldn't be thinking oh yes it's great to have this really focused world building of like five races I would say like no no give me more 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 and I would just want, I would want more ideas to kind of like uh, catch me. Um, so I, I see why why they're in there. But it's kind of weird just having like one race that is just turtles and one race that is just cats. I kind of wish they did something more with them. I'm sure I'm missing all the, the rich lore. Um, uh, this guy speaks to me. What's his deal? He's like a rock man. And he goes off. There's a lot of messing around on ethereal planes and stuff like that. Um, throat leech is like... Oh, well, hang on. We, we can't see. Um, throat leech here is perhaps like the most... The most D&D monster name I can think of. If you can think of like a weird bug and a part of your, part of your body that it would go into, then, then that's it. Spirit troll. I'm I'm on board with the spirit troll. What's his deal? Oh wow, okay. So they are the product of perverted magical interbreeding of trolls and invisible stalkers. Um okay. Uh Umpleby is like the least threatening name I can see. Eight foot tall, four hundred pounds. What's the deal? Um, they're just a big oh they can store static electricity right okay good to know I like this guy and I think we are nearly at the end we are are there any hidden gems in the sort of appendices here no so that is um, some qualitative monster design <laughs> Um, if you are interested in 
what I was talking about classes earlier. I am going to hopefully be writing up a sort of a, a post talking about applying this kind of design to classes as well. Um, again, I'm going to give credit to uh, Cosmic Orrery for um, sort of sparking this idea. So if you want to check out Cosmic Orrery's blog, it is the Cosmic .com and it's, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, as always, if you want to keep up to date with what I'm doing, you can go to bastionland.com. If you want to support these streams and blog posts and everything like that, you can go to patreon.com forward slash bastionland. And um, if you want to get in touch, I've said, I'm not going to say this every week, but I've kind of, I'm, I'm trying to leave Twitter, um, <laughs> except for like posting the occasional update. So if you want to get in touch with me, the best thing to do is to go to bastionland.com and join the Discord server. That is, um, that is linked on the sidebar there. Um, so next week, there may be a slight change um, because I'm actually, hopefully, fingers crossed, next Tuesday I'm meeting up with a friend to actually play some uh, Grimlight <laughs> at a table in person, which is very exciting. Um, so I think that the stream will probably be on a different evening next week, but I will let you know when I know about that. But until then... It's goodbye for now.